Hi, my name is Mark Barley, and I'm here to talk to you about accessibility. I'm the founder and executive director of the Able Gamers charity. Able Gamers mission is to enable play in order to combat social isolation, foster inclusive communities to improve the lives of people with disabilities. I've been working at the forefront of making sure people with disabilities are included in the amazing world of video games since 2004. The presentation I'm about to give you is really the culmination of a work of a lot of really smart people from all over the world who've created a new way to think about accessibility in a way that you can include accessibility in your work. I founded Able Gamers. I am a person with disabilities, but my disability largely does not affect the way I play video games. I founded Able Gamers because my best friend, my best friend since middle school, and I used video games to stay connected. Every Friday we would log on and play and I'm gonna age myself, EverQuest together. And every Friday I knew that me and my friend who was 2,000 miles away, 4,000 kilometers away, were gonna have an amazing rich time. Well, one Friday my friend didn't log in. I waited and I waited. And so I picked up the phone and I called my friend and her husband answered the phone. And as he said, hello, I could hear my best friend, Stephanie, crying in the background because several years prior she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and that afternoon multiple sclerosis had decided that her mousing hand just wasn't going to work and she was watching her disability take away video games so i said i'm going to solve this problem we're going to solve this problem and at the time i found nothing um but I started a movement, and that movement has led to the conversation I'm having with you today. Let's have a conversation about accessibility. You know, we use technology to do tasks, and we want people to be successful at those tasks. When you dial a phone and you hit go, you want that phone call connect. Because accessibility is often framed on whether someone can do or can't do a task. This is what shaped inclusive design since the 1960s. You know, can a person do a thing? Game interactive technology is, we gotta look at that a little bit differently. When you create games, are you really, is the purpose of your game to move the character around? Is it to go from point A to point B? Is it to do the jump puzzle exactly right? Is it to eliminate enemies? Tasks are not usually why we play, am I right? You know, when I'm playing in Mass Effect, you know, I'm, you know, seducing green aliens and exploring the universe. I'm not just moving a character around. If I'm playing Spider-Man, you know, I want the thrill of swinging between buildings in New York City and, you know, capturing the bad guys. You know, I can feel the wind as I'm making those moves. Or if I'm playing Last of Us 2, I'm on a journey looking for answers and trying to avoid clickers as best I can. You know, this is what games are about. Games are about experiences. Providing accessibility to game is about designers and developers removing barriers to keep players with disabilities um, so that they can have the experience you as the developer want them to have, and thus providing an accessible player experience. Historically, we've, had, we've really started looking at the experiential data. Well, able gamers were very privileged to be able to do studies. We have one of the largest pools of players with disabilities out there, and we did a study really looking at experiences. And on the slide here is the makeup of our panel when we did this study. So you can see it was a very diverse group of players with disabilities. And so we discovered, for example, that 45% of people were using key mapping, um, while 41% were turning on subtitles. And that number there, that 41%, got us thinking well, our player panel only had about 11% of people who
who had an auditory disability, a disability we think that people would always be using subtitles, yet 41% were using subtitles. And so we started digging into the table, the data, and we discovered that, you know, women turn on subtitles more than men, that people who identify as having autism will oftentimes turn on subtitles because they're looking for more context of what's going on. And what we're really discovering is accessibility is about helping far more people than you think a particular modality or a particular feature would. We asked players with disabilities like what their play, play style was. 39% said that they were hardcore gamers. 59% identified as gamers. And typical play sessions were really large. I mean, over half the people played a lot. And what is really interesting is players with disabilities largely tacked with other non-disabled populations that call themselves gamers. Asking about how they played online, we, you know, what they said was they were playing with real life friends. They were playing with clans and strangers. You know, the vast majority of players with disabilities are in the online spaces enjoying games as we speak. So why is this important? Well, talking about changing the narrative to experience, what are the experiences players look for in games? What are the experiences? What are the, re the ingredients that build the game that you're working on? What are, those, what are those things that gamers are looking for? We embarked on another study where we asked a group of players with disabilities and we asked a large group of people who did not identify as having a disability. We asked them what they looked for and why gaming was important to you. And what was so fascinating is we found that there were five overarching experiences that every player was looking at. But in the disability population, there was the sixth experience that we did not see in the able-bodied population. Let's talk about some of those experiences. These are the things players are looking for when they're, when they're playing your games. The first one is connecting. You know, someone in our player panel said, I can always use gaming to socialize with friends who enjoy gaming. We can play and enjoy together. It bonds us through having fun. While someone who doesn't identify as having a disability says, because of the communities that are created around gaming, the shared experiences that you gain through playing games, through playing, like you have real intimate experiences. You know. I'll tell you a story about a profoundly disabled young woman who was in middle school. And when I say profoundly disabled, what I mean is she had a ventilator and she was in a wheelchair. And the fact that she was disabled, she couldn't hide. She told me a story about she went to a new school and the class that she had just before lunch, um, she sat in the back of the class because the door to the classroom was in the rear. And she sat in the back of the class and she told me that the first week that she was in school, no one said anything to her. She was in a classroom full of able-bodied children and no one was saying anything to her. Well, that Friday, the instruction had ended a bit early and the teacher had said, you guys can chat among yourselves um, before the bell. And she told me that these two young men in front of her started talking to a young man in front of them about World of Warcraft. And she happened to blurt out, oh, I have a level 45 hunter. All of the sudden, these kids who hadn't said a word to her turned around and said, oh my goodness, what server are you on? Blah, 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 blah. Because all of a sudden, as this person said, there's this shared experience that made this profoundly disabled person less disabled because we like the same things. She went on to tell me that two of those 
kids were in her high school together and they were best of friends and one of them even went to the same college and she still talks to to this day and she's in her 30s. All because she said, I have a level 45 hunter. That's the power of games and the power of connection. What's one of the other experiences people are looking for? Diversion. I think we can all understand this, especially now through COVID, you know, looking at video games, it helps me wind down from a hard day of work. When I'm feeling anxious or nervous, I can play video games for stress release. Yes, we're definitely using video games as a diversion. The next one, escape, allowing different it, you know, one person with disability says it allows to travel to different worlds that are extra nice when it's hard to get out in real life. It reveals the, it relieves the sameness of sitting in a chair all day. Someone who doesn't identify as having a disability. There are some other worlds you can jump into and it allows you to experience different lives that you would never be able to experience in the real world. That's what's amazing about the content that I know developers are making is the worlds that you create, not only for some people to be able to visit a representation of a real space, but for all of us to be able to really explore future selves and things like that. Escapism is an important experience that we're all looking for in games. Games is art. As cultural enrichment, games have beautiful, touching, and clever stories, which I love. The art of games is often just as inspiring as art at a museum. Someone without a disability said it gives me an outlet to express creativity and also experience the creativity of, that other people decide to create. I think, again, I look at game developers now and I look at the tool sets you have available. And, you know, game makers are the modern day you know, Picassos, they're the modern day de Gaulle's because these amazing worlds deserve to be looked at as art. Um, in this, in this here, I was invited to a major studio to see a game that was in development and they, you know, a lot of big game studios have that beauty room as I call them. And they put me in this room with a, you know, a two and a half meter TV with you know seven surround sound and they handed me a controller and they dropped me into the dev build and they dropped me into this ravine and the ravine had like rocks on each side and there was you know trees over me and the sunlight was being dappled through the trees and onto the rocks and the surround sound showed told me that there was this you know wind slowly moving through the trees and I was just like paused for a second and my host she said, hey, Mark, are you okay? And I went, shh, shh, shh. I just want to be here for a second because it was like this meditative space um, that I just wanted to experience from the artistic value that it was bringing. I think if you've ever played the Oculus um, Rift game Moss, you'll understand that sometimes after you complete a world, it's cool to just sit there and enjoy it. These are those experiences enriching people are looking to use games to enrich themselves i studied english when i was a child and now i'm studying japanese because of games it helps me work with problem solving skills we look at games as a way of gaining new skills these are those experiences that people are looking for but for people with disabilities enablement came out which was only unique to the people with disabilities. Overwatch is one of the first games that puts me on the same level as my able-bodied friends. Games are important because of my limited mobility. I'm able to go places and do things that I couldn't do in reality. That was a unique experience that players were with disabilities were looking for while all players were looking for the other five that we talked about. So what is game accessibility? Well, game accessibility is creating games that everyone can play. There's been some systems out there, what we call the old system. The problems with them is they were hard to understand. They told you what to do, and really importantly, they stifled creativity. Game developers and game makers are some of the most creative people in the world, 
and the old system would tell you you need to do this. But did you? There's a really famous um, UX researcher who identifies as being autistic named James Knight. And he says, I'm going to say something that's very unpopular. I think guidelines are a bad idea. They tell you the answer without letting you know what the problem is. And I think that's really important when looking at the amount of creativity that's in the game creation space. I think if you have the right tool, you can solve those problems. So what do players see as important features? Well, we ask players what their top five features that they were looking for from that accessibility standpoint. And at the access option, and we'll go a little bit deeper into this, they were looking for clear text, recoloring options, alternate channels, ability to customize the presentation. They were looking for, for ways to make sure that they could gain information in and out of the game. And this leads us to what access options are. Access options are the first level, the first thought process you need to think about when you're creating an accessible player experience. This really talks about a player having the ability to take action, tell you what their intent is, and then for them to understand the state of the game. So what are the options? What are the things that player has? Well, the player has potentially the controller, the mouse, the keyboard. Those are the ways the player is talking to the game. What are the channels that the game has to share with that player what has happened? You have the monitor. You potentially have haptic. You have the, 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 you know, the sound. So you have those are your ways of expressing the state of the game. Then there's challenge, progress options, training options, skip options. These are the things that are the things in the game that you're asking the player to do. And that creates what we call the player loop which a player takes action, the state of the game is changed, the state of the game is fed to the player, then there's this gameplay itself that's shared with that player. Accessibility is very different in gaming than in what we would say regular technology. And what I mean by that is in regular technology like at Amazon or something like that, they want zero barriers, no challenge to you buying that toaster. You know, they would sell a lot less toasters if between you putting it in your cart, you had to run a jump puzzle. Nope, they don't want that. They want you to be able to do it easy breezy chicken sneezy. But in games, challenge is something we want. And so we want to find ways to tune those challenges. And that's where we came up with a set of design patterns that lead you to making real decisions on how to create accessibility. When the design of the game to be more accessible for player with disabilities, there's often a problem that while you can, that can crop up in different places. Design patterns are a way of capturing these common elements and applying a lot of different solutions in different contexts without specifically telling you exactly how to solve that problem, without stifling that creativity. They're common occurred. And how you really need to think about this, and we create what we call the APX triangle, is before you tackle challenge, you must tackle access. And then challenge, and then AP, and then you have an accessible player experience. I know this sounds like a lot, so I'm gonna kind of talk to you about the tool set where it is readily available right now. So the APX is, um, a tool. It's available right now for free on accessible.games. All of the design patterns are there with examples, but I'm going to go over a few with you right now to show you how the design patterns work, the drivers behind them, the thinking behind them, some examples of how they're, how they're being used, and 
hopefully this will give you an opportunity to jump into the website and really start using this tool for yourself on creating really rich accessible experiences. So our access design patterns have really catchy names, second channel, same controls but different, flexible controllers, clear text, distinguish this from that. These, these patterns here, if you learn about them, they're available on the website and the drivers behind them, you can solve your access loop so that players with disabilities have the options that they need to tell the game what their intent is and that you're using the proper channels that are strong for that player to tell them the state of the game. One of my favorite to really bring home this idea is the pattern called second channel. Now, all design patterns, whether they're ours or they're in architecture or they're in regular software, they'll have a design problem. And for second channel, the design problems our players are unable or unreliably able to take in information via a particular modality and cannot solely rely on that information. All of our patterns have drivers. Remember I told you before it tells you they, that Mr. Knight said it tells you what to do, but not why you're doing it. The drivers are kind of the why you're doing it. So players who are blind or low vision may need alternative um, or enhancements to visual information through audio or haptic. What that means is if something is showing on screen, some event, some action on screen with a giant fanfare, they might not be able to see it. They're looking for an audio piece to it. Players who are deaf or low vision may need enhancements to speech or non-speech sounds through a haptic or visual presentation. Again, if you're using sound to tell me that the monsters are coming, but I can't hear you, how do I know? So what's that visual indication for that? Players are who in noisy environments may just need alternatives to visual information um, through, a, through audio or haptic, or through visual or haptic, that's a typo, I apologize. And so the design solutions is players can select additional channels of information via different modalities so that we can reliably take in information. So let's look at some examples of that. So some examples of second channel are, for instance, distinct sound effects for every single move in Street Fighter II. What this has allowed is this has allowed players who are totally blind to compete at a competitive level at Street Fighter because every single move has a distinct sound that creates a unique soundscape that allows those players to completely understand what's going on and kick my butt every single time. Or for example, here in Left 4 Dead 2, they had something where they had captioning, but they had full captioning as well. I alluded to that game used audio all the time to let you know certain activities were happening. And so as you can see in the picture, the second picture and the third picture, they used this special color with the brackets and the thing to give you indications of sounds that were happening in your environment. You know, when the church bell tolled, you knew that the next wave was coming. And so this was an excellent example of them creating a second channel in order to make sure that everyone was going to be able to play this game. What we have found, because we have a certification program I'll talk to you about at the end, where we go deep dive into everything, is what studios are coming back to us and telling us is the patterns are also giving them a shared language. And I love talking about the shared language right here at Second Channel. Because if we understand what Second Channel means, and a developer or a graphic designer comes to a production meeting and shows me this beautiful leveling graphic. Hey, when you level, there's this amazing fanfare that comes around, this beautiful butterflies fly around you to let you know you've leveled. And it's stunning. I can look at that, that artist and say, I love what you've done, but I believe we have a second channel problem. And because me and that artist understands exactly what second channel means, 
that artist, she may go, you know, you're right. Let me reach out to the audio team and let's get a really amazing sound bump to go with that. In a single sentence, our studios are coming back and telling us that the simple sentence, we have a second channel problem, is an incredibly complex accessibility conversation that we just had. We just talked about how a player who is deaf or hard of hearing um, will have this beautiful, needs a beautiful soundscape to know what's, or will need a beautiful, will have this beautiful graphic to go with it. But a player who might not see very well, uh, uh, hear very well, or might have the sound turned really low down because there's a baby sleeping in the other room, you know, isn't, is going to see that they have it. We've done this where we've had this complex, um, this complex conversation just with a simple sentence. Sorry if that was confusing. I'm doing this all in one take. Let's talk about another one, same controls, but different. Players cannot effectively use the controls of the game in their standard configuration. Our drivers, these are the drivers that are pretty well understood around the argument about remappability and thinking your controllers. Players with physical disabilities will need to remap controls to alternate um, controllers. Players may need to use a keyboard and mouse. Players may need to revamp controllers on a standard controller in order to reach those outcomes. I kind of say here, there's a reason why locking your Windows PC was Control-Alt-Delete. And the reason being is the inventor said you could never accidentally do it. Well, interestingly, you also need two hands most of the time to do it. Players with physical disabilities may need to remap controls to decrease the number of repeat key presses. You know, that um, quick time event where you want them to press the, you know, the space bar or the square a hundred million times, you know, they might not be able to do that. Players with physical disabilities may need to toggle on things instead of being able to hold them down because of fatigue. If you've ever played like an MMO on a, on a mouse and keyboard, it's the numlock lock that just kind of sets you running in a direction. Players with physical disabilities may need to avoid certain combinations of buttons. You know, maybe two buttons close together is, is not good for their particular disability and they may want to move those around. Or players with cognitive disabilities may just want to simplify controllers so that they can remember the control configuration. Again, what's really great about APX in general is the design patterns encapsulate the needs of players with disabilities. And so you work at the pattern level and you're making decisions that affect all players with disabilities. So you don't have to go, well, I want to do physical disabled or you know, cognitive disabled, or let's really just focus on the deaf or hard of hearing. If you look at the patterns, you'll see that the patterns contain the needs of all people with disabilities. So let's look at some examples of same controls, but different. Oh, I'm sorry. So our design solution is players are able to remap controls of the game so that they can eff effectively use the controls and its interfaces. So complete remappability such as an in Injustice 2, you can see here, you can change every single one of the buttons as well as multi-toggle movements on and off, special moves required to diagonal movements off, um, release special moves to execute the buttons are released. You can actually control that so that you don't run into those fatigues. You don't run into those um, ways that will make the game unplayable for a player with disabilities. Um, in uh, Near Automata, they had camera controls. This is an interesting thing where you can move horizontal and vertically. You can change those camera controls um, you can also create a speeds on how the camera moves so that, you know, maybe I don't have a lot of movement. I need the camera to move quickly or I need it to move um, not quickly. You can also do, you know, tracking and things like that. This is a really good way of, you know, making sure that I could set the controls so that I can tell the game what I'm trying to do. Or, for instance, here in Splatoon, they turned off motion control. So you could actually turn off motion control. You could also set the sensitivity of motion control. So maybe I didn't 
I wasn't able to go like this. I can only go like this. I could actually change that and I could change it inverted on the different axes. So these are really good examples of same controls, but different. Here's that toggle t comment we talked about, being able to toggle on sprint, being able to, you know, versus a hold, vehicle sensitivity, controller dead zone. This is really interesting. Think of this as creating a dead zone around a joystick in case I have a trimmer. So if I have a trimmer, it will not do anything if I move the joystick from like zero to 20, because I've set it that way, but from 20 to 100 is the actual movement. These are great examples of it. Or using two controllers all together. That's one of the other things we can do is just use two controllers. So those are two of the patterns around access. Let's talk about challenge. So as I said, challenge pat patterns are really different because they're about the player doing the thing in the game that you're wanting them to do. And interestingly, these are the ingredients that you're working with when you're making games, performative, emotional, cognitive, and decision-making. These are those things, these are the ingredients of the game you make. Can you do the thing that we ask you to do, the jump puzzle? Um, if you have music in your game, you're looking for an emotional experience. Puzzles themselves, cognitive and then decision making. So the challenge patterns really focus around these broad groups of challenges. And here are the challenge patterns. Bypass, training ground, moderation in all things, helping hand, undo, redo. You know, the challenge patterns here are, and as I said, they're different than Amazon. Amazon does not want to have the jump puzzle between you and that toaster. It's different for gaming. So let's look at bypass. Bypass is your catch-all pattern. Players cannot successfully engage in part of the game even after all possible adjustments have been made. What are the drivers on this? So players with physical disabilities may need to skip reflex or performative challenges in order to make progress in a game. Players with cognitive disabilities may need to skip decision-making to make progress in a game. Players with learning disabilities may need to skip challenges involving large amounts of text reading to make progress in the game. Players just may want to skip the content because of time challenges. So the solution is players can skip part of a game so that they can make progress. Now, you may say, why do I want my play? Why do I want this skipped? Well, you, if, if I can't get through it, I can't consume your story. If I can't get through it, then I may have wasted money and now I'm mad at you. And is that jump puzzle or is that quick time event? Is it that important? Let's look at some examples of bypass. So quick time events being skipped. Here in Spider Marvel Spider-Man, they let you turn it on. And what they did was if you turned quick time events being, they ran them as just cutscenes. So you still got the beauty of whatever that quick time event was supposed to be, but they took away the need for me or you to press that button 500 times. The story still progressed. The win still happened. And I was able to continue to go on. Here in Inferium, they literally have one where you can turn off the enemies, no permadeath, more tutorials. They created a game because this was story driven. They wanted people to consume the story was more important than the performative challenges. And so they created this mechanism so that you could get through the story if that's what you need to do. And you could really craft it. You know what? I want slower foes so that I have a better chance. Or I, you know what, I don't want any at all. The next challenge pattern that I wanna talk about is training ground. Players cannot gain the skills to succeed in a game through the usual means of training used by the game. What are our drivers here? So players with physical disabilities may, may need to practice skills and trial new configurations. Players with cognitive disabilities may want to practice longer so that they can gain the skills to complete, to, to gain those competences. Players may want to just practice to gain skills and mastery. 
So the solution is players can practice in a variety of ways on their own in time so that they can gain the skills that they need to succeed in the game. I think a game that really does this beautifully that I use all the time is Overwatch. You know, I don't want to go embarrass myself. So I will use the training ground to go learn to play one of the new heroes, you know, so that I don't embarrass myself when I get out there. So Rocket League is a really awesome opportunity for play uh, for training grounds. They have a free play where you can set up different bots, you can set up how it works, or you can set up no bots at all. So you can just drive around, test the controllers that you're working on, get a feel for the game, and kind of get good in an environment that you're not going to feel embarrassed or, or, or anything like that. Great example. I kept those short because I think we can, you know, there's a lot of really great uh, examples of this, but really let's go back to what we were talking about at the beginning. So let's look at the loop again. So the blue really represents the, uh, the access layer. This is a player being able to tune the controls that they have to tell the game what is going on, a change in the state of the game, and then the game letting the players know what that state looks like, and then the gameplay itself, the challenge part, and then the player takes an action. This is the loop that every player has taken, and this is I'm going to give you an idea of where you need to start looking at when you're starting to craft accessible experiences. This is telling you that if I'm working with controls or I'm trying to tell the player something, I probably need to look in access. But if it's about the challenges, I, you know, I'm wanting them to solve this puzzle, then the patterns that are going to help you create those accessible player experiences, those are going to be in the challenge patterns. So the use of these, these will generate ideas. You guys are the most creative people out there. They're a holistic approach to accessibility that does not make you choose between players. There are countless examples on accessible.games that are going to inspire you with really good examples that could sit alongside your existing approach. Again, over and over again, the feedback we're getting from our partners is it's giving us a shared language to have unique conversations about accessibility. But what I think is so important to every person here is it also lets you make those decisions before you've spent a lot of time coding and graphic design. The thing I always tell developers is the wrong question is how do I make this game accessible? Because that's large, that's really going to be difficult. But the right question is how do I make this experience accessible? And that's going to give you the ability to look at a slice of your game, a moment of time and say, what is the experience I want this player to have right now? Is it a, a performative experience? Is it an emotional experience? What is it? How do I, how do I create a barrier free? How do I make sure that a challenge doesn't become a barrier? How do I make sure that if this challenge does become a barrier, I've put in the things that those people will need so that it isn't a barrier. And when you think, how do I make this experience accessible? It's going to be so much easier to think about accessibility. Look no further than last of us Two. last of us Two is a multi-million dollar triple A game that people who identified as blind were able to complete. APX was part of their design model. Um, Naughty Dog has a history of accessibility, but I, as the leader of Able Gamers, the, 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 you know, the, the godfather of mainstreaming game accessibility, I did not think I was gonna see a triple A game that a totally blind person can play for at least another decade. And yet, there we are. So this is a really valuable tool. I wanna to talk to you really briefly. If you like this, if accessibility is a passion for you, 
we have something called the Certified Accessible Player Experience Practitioner Course. It is a two-day hands-on live course with our instructors where we have exercises and it'll help you spot accessibility issues during de your design, find solutions to those issues, and more importantly, how to win arguments when management says it's not important. Um, there are 46 million players with disabilities in the United States alone. 46 million people with disabilities in the United States alone have billions of dollars of expendable income. And we've seen earlier in this conversation, they are playing games. And so who doesn't want more success, more players? enjoying their content. You can find out more information about this course on the same website as the patterns, accessible.games. We do have a European-based course coming up in a couple of months. Um, I have to get up at three in the morning to give that course. So I encourage everyone to go to accessible.games to learn more. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. My name is Mark Barlet. You can follow me on Twitter, and should you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me.